right. Well, folks, today we're going to have something really special in terms of a case study. I have the uh, opportunity today to chat with somebody who manages the marketing strategy for a remarkable brand. And, you know, a lot of what we talk about in the core marketing method is about leveraging the assets that you have at your disposal, being creative and innovative and resourceful. And I think today we're going to hear about some good examples of, of you know, take away some principles that we'll be able to use in our own businesses. Uh, and to help us with that today, I'm having a chat with Fred, who is actually the strategy, head of strategy at Sullivan's Cove down there in Tasmania. Fred, thanks for taking a few minutes to speak with us. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me. Of course, and it's good to hear another Aussie accent. But as, I, as you mentioned to me before, before we got started on this, you are actually, you sound like an Aussie, but you also are an American citizen, if I've got that right. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got dual citizenship, so I actually went to high school and university in New York. So quickly, does that mean you have to vote in American elections as well? Uh, I'm allowed to, yeah. <laughs> but it's not compulsory. They, they don't come looking for you. Of course, it's voluntary. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I only get fined if I don't vote in the Aussie ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For those uh, Americans who are looking in Australia, we are actually compelled to vote. We don't have the option. We have to vote. Um, Fred, please introduce yourself. Tell us how it is that you came to start working for this, uh, for this whiskey distillery. Right. Um, well, I'm a bartender by trade. I've been in the hospitality industry for over 20 years now. Um, I was lucky enough during my bartending career to uh, work for a couple of top bars and ended up getting some uh, sort of brand ambassador work with some of the bigger distributors, people like Diageo and Bacardi. Um, and from there, I sort of built my own little bar and beverage consultancy, sort of doing freelance brand management mm -hmm. uh, for a range of different uh, brands, both big and small. And through that work, I met the managing to um, brand management and strategy for them. Gotcha. I, I'm hoping that my little uh, dodgy internet connection didn't lose the last part. I, I made sense of what you were saying. But, so, so you took. It sounds like you took some skills that you developed up professionally as an employee, and, and initially before working for Sullivan's Cove, you actually had your own small business. By the sounds of things. Yeah, absolutely. Just as a sort of sole trader, um, like I said, doing kind of freelance brand management for startup and independent and smaller brands that couldn't necessarily afford um, a sort of full marketing department, basically. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. Now, for people who are single malt fans, they, they may already know about Sullivan's Cove. I certainly do as a proud Aussie and a single malt drinker myself. But for those who don't know about it, tell us a little bit about the brand, the company, and, and uh, why you guys are special. <laughs> so uh, Sullivan's Cove is one of the sort of original three or four distilleries of the kind of modern craft whiskey movement. It um it's a very very young industry uh we have a long history of making whiskey in australia but in terms of craft whiskey uh it's, it's very new so we've been around for a lot longer than most of the craft distilleries there's a bit of a boom happening now but we were one of the original few and um it's really uh like a lot of tasmanian distilleries the scale is absolutely tiny we make one one hundredth of what a standard sort of commercial single malt scotch whiskey distillery would make. We've got one tiny little still. And so our point of difference is that rather than aiming for the efficiencies that you would in a high volume business, we really do everything absolutely by hand. And we're aiming for low volume, very, very high quality. Um, yeah, everything we do in the production process is designed to create flavor and character in our whiskey rather than trying to create 1% of and stop that that one little bit and crank out hundreds of thousands of units um so we're really only producing about 15 to twenty thousand bottles total a year and demand for those bottles is very high so that keeps our prices high you know by coincidence i don't know if there's some parallels here but uh, you know when i moved to the us uh, which has now been a few years ago i did not know, know a great deal about bourbons uh, but there mm. is a, you know, in Kentucky, for example, there's a bit of a bourbon tradition there. And there's a, uh, there's a bourbon distiller here called Blanton's, which I see a, a few parallels in that they also started to get some recognition, won some mm. awards, a smaller operator compared to some of the bigger ones around them. And, you know, now you have to search high and low, actually, to get a bottle of Blanton's. Much it has been my experience for bourbon uh, drinkers. They might be interested to know that Sullivan's Cove is a little bit similar and that you have to you have to really dig around to get a bottle of Sullivan's Cove because they're in such demand. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, Blanton's is a fantastic club. Oh, completely different scale. Blanton's is actually produced by Buffalo Trace Distillery, which is right. one of the biggest distilleries in the U.S. It's one of their smaller brands that they produce. Right. Um, you know, sort of pick through their casks to find the best ones to use in the Blanton's label. Right. Um, but yeah, that's you know a similar situation in terms of uh, demand, sort of far outseeding supply in terms of the products that we produce. But as you say, the background business is still quite different. They are a big operator compared to yours, which has found a, a sort of a kind of an important niche to carve out, right? So. That's it. And um, like a lot of those big distilleries, they have their sort of ultra premium brands, the Pappy Van Winkles and the Blantons and that type of stuff. Um, but they also have their big high volume brands, things like Buffalo Trace Bourbon and the other stuff that they produce there, which are really uh, where they're sort of making, out, uh, making their profits from. We don't have that level. We don't have like an entry level product that we make. We're 100% focused on producing the best possible single malt we can. So uh, the, the analogy that I sometimes use is that, um, you know, we're Bugatti, we're not Toyota. Yeah, right. <laughs> that makes, that's a good analogy. And, uh, you know, if you don't mind me asking, so you, you push out 15 to 20,000 bottles a year. At this point in uh, the, the Sullivan's Cove story, would you say mm. that the, the, the business, is it at a point, is it, a, is it approximately the point of, of profitability and growth where yourself and, and the owners of the business would anticipate you guys being at? Uh, yeah, look, we're tracking pretty well. I guess the interesting thing about whiskey is that, um, you know, we were a very, very small and completely unknown brand, basically outside of the, the small island of Tasmania. Uh, and it really wasn't until we won that major award in 2014 that the demand for our products really sort of increased massively. And, and the interesting thing about whiskey is it's an interesting marketing position to be in because we can't just turn around and produce more. We age our whiskies for a minimum of sort of nine or 10 years. So in 2014, we did start producing more whiskey, although still on a, on a very small scale compared to a, a sort of commercial distillery. And um, we won't see any of that increase in production still for another four or five years minimum, right? So we have been gradually scaling up, uh, sort of still within the same production methodology. We're not changing the style of our whiskey at all, but we have been gradually scaling up over the last few years since the award. Um, but it'll still be a really long time before we actually see any of that stuff ready to go into the bottle. But I should say in the interim, you've gone on to still receive more accolades, right? So this, this idea of uh, the credibility around you guys as a premium offering has only been building on itself, if I, if I read that correctly. Yeah, that's correct. So we won world's best single malt in 2014, and that was really what kind of kicked it all off for us. And then in 2018 and in 2000, and single malt. So we're the only distillery in the world to have ever won that award back to back, and one of only maybe three or four whiskey distilleries globally to ever have won three world's best awards. That's amazing. And so when you're, you know, this lag period, it, it, it sounds like you'd imagine that'd be worlds apart, but a lot of my commercial background has actually been in healthcare, where the development of brands takes a very long time for kind of research reasons. But yeah. funnily enough, the concept is the same. You sort of, you get, an early, uh, you get an early indication of potential change in the marketplace for which you need to cultivate a plan to respond. You guys are doing that now in whiskeys. How do you think things will change when, uh, you know, it sounds like your capacity has ramped up a little. Do you anticipate that you're going to, are you always going to try and pursue that premium spot in the marketplace, even when this, this uh, greater volume of production sort of comes to fruition for you? Uh, certainly within the Sullivan's Cove brand, absolutely. Um, that, that's what we're known for and that's what we're going to keep trying to do. And, and again, you know, to give you a sense of scale, even now that we're at full production, we're still going to be absolutely minuscule compared to even a, a relatively small single malt scotch whiskey distillery. Let's say um, someone like Talisker, for example, beautiful, consistent, delicious uh, single malt scotch, happy to drink it every day. Um, and again, we would even at full capacity, we're producing about one one hundredth of what they would be able to produce. So it's, um, you know, because we are that small and because demand is high and we do just want to maintain the quality that we're known for, that's, that's really what we're sticking, sticking with. There's, um, 
quite a few producers in Australia now who are kind of they've actually built commercial scale distilleries. They're going for scale and they're going for volume. Um, and we're super happy for those guys to play around in that space. And, and we're going to stick our guns with just making the absolute best possible whiskey we can. Look, uh, without pretending to be an expert in the, in the alcohol space, I think the logic that you're talking about makes perfect sense. You guys have, have uh, it strikes me as an outside observer that through um, the surprise value of this uh, distillery down in Tasmania, kind of upsetting the tradition of particularly scotches and maybe occasionally Japanese whiskey, but this, this mm. Tasmanian distiller, all of a sudden, you know, in, in uh, business, you could not buy that kind of surprise value. And it, it, has, yeah. it, it forces the marketplace to create a new narrative, right? So Sullivan's go, I'm really, as an Aussie, of course, I'm really proud that a business has been able to do that. And it sounds like you're capitalizing on it. And I think it would be a mistake to diverge too far away from what that narrative has formed, which is this small, beautiful, kind of mysterious distillery down there in Tasmania creating something that is clearly the world's best. And uh, with that, that's, that's all the ingredients for a premium offering. So uh, I'm really happy with what you guys are doing. I'm really pleased you're doing it. And I, I can't wait to come down and visit you guys in person. I have been, by the way, to the Talisca distillery before. It's also great. <laughs> but, so Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It, it sounds like you, you've given me a few ideas there about what you see as good and bad about being a smaller player. And, and that, that premium position, I think, it, you know, I'm all about a narrative, I think, for marketing. And, and I think you guys have got a really wonderful narrative already sort of underway. And it looks like you're remaining true to that. But I'd like to know, what have you been doing, understanding the limitations of your volume, but what have you been doing to grab the attention of new customers? You know, obviously... The announcement back in 2014 was big, but what, what have you proactively been doing as a company or you as a brand strategist to say, let's get the attention of new people and make them notice Sullivan's Cove? What do you do practically? Well, I, I think you absolutely nailed it when you said narrative, um, because you know our whiskies are in very, very high demand. When we do a release, we, we sell a lot of stuff direct to consumer. When we do a release online, we'll often sell out within, you know, an hour or two of, of putting uh, a release up it's just it's gone so our ability to put whiskey in front of new customers is really limited you know uh, we have a, a a mailing list that we send out our releases to and they're all kind of rabid sullivan's co fans uh, but what we really do try to do is find ways to engage people with the story of sullivan's cove so we do that through social media um, we do that through traditional media and we're lucky that we get a lot of organic media interest in us because it is an interesting story um, and then we do a lot of direct marketing so we have a cellar door at the distillery we get lots and lots of visitors every day and we spend a lot of time with them you know we take them on a full tour of the distillery we sit them down we do a guided tasting we really tell the story to them um, and then we also go around Australia and occasionally to other countries whenever we can. Um, we're still a very small team, but we get out there as much as we can. And, and with 20 or 30 people, again, in a really intimate environment, spend a lot of time with them and really tell that story and get them to understand where we're coming from. And so that's, that's our primary way of engaging with people. That's really interesting. You know, uh, Fred, I, I've developed a system for, for business owners to try and help with this idea of leveraging narrative and story in, in, in what they do. And it calls out two sort of parts of a customer journey. One where someone makes a very transactional purchase, maybe a one-off purchase. And then the alternative yeah. about taking an existing, uh, either a customer or somebody that you're engaged with already and sort of moving them along a continuum to improve the value of that relationship from a brand to a customer. And the way you describe your activity, particularly this very practical immersive cellar door thing, or then when you're touring around meeting people, it sounds to me like you're not only introducing people to Sullivan's Cove, but you're deliberately taking them along this continuum to kind of know more, get a little bit more committed themselves to the idea of it so that they become longer term customers, which I, I guess that also leads me to another a subsequent question. As a marketing strategist, again, it's a unique thing where you're limited with, with your supply, I guess at this point, but do you see the future of Sullivan's Cove being uh, sort of branching out to greater breadth of new customers? Or do you want to go deeper and 
and invest more heavily in, in getting more loyalty with your, the existing Sullivan's Cove fans? Or is it a bit of both or where do you see it, it going from here? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say it's a bit of both. I mean, yeah, just to your point about existing customers and taking people along a continuum, I guess for us, because it is very low volume, but what we think is very high quality, we want to offer that level of engagement with people as well, as opposed to having a billboard, which we hope you glance at on the highway on your way to work. We'd rather sit down and spend two hours with you. And we'd rather do that with 50 people than having a million people see a billboard for half a second. Right. So, you know, I'm not going to lie, our products are expensive. We're asking people to invest a lot. Uh, um, and so we're trying to offer that experience back to them, you know, in terms of the way that we market, we're willing to spend the time and actually, yeah, do that with a small group of people and really kind of improve their experience with the brand, I suppose, and make that a really high quality interaction as well. Um, but of course we want to grow our market in terms of the, the number of people around the world who know our brand and who respect our brand and who see it in that premium space. Um, we're certainly not a household name yet uh, internationally, although we're pretty well known amongst Australian whiskey drinkers at this point, as you know, as you said, sort of hometown heroes. Um, and we really do want to be kind of associated with that ultra premium idea of, of hard to find really delicious, really interesting whiskies um all over the world so that's why we do export a very small amount of our product um just to just as a seeding exercise yeah i think you said the states in japan in western europe that they can actually have the opportunity to taste every once in a while that's awesome um fred i'm i'm, I'm disappointed that our, my internet connection seems to be playing up but i i was making out everything you were saying you, you touched on your you know it's a premium product and you have a premium price as well did you um did you find that when you were introducing these prices did that uh, do you find customers balk at that or is it at the right point do you, do you find that you've got enough committed fans that actually the price makes sense for them I, I, let me tell you what my little subtitle to this question is do you feel sure. like the do you feel like the premium price that you've attached to this actually suggests something in itself towards the quality of the brand it's a branding to my view it's a branding exercise in its own right so it, the fact that it costs a bit of money says to me if everyone else is willing to pay this this must make some sense this must be a high quality drop you know that psychology that i'm referring to and, yeah absolutely and so how do um, you find customers mean, respond to your price at the cellar door of the award our prices were significantly lower um because there was significantly less demand but at that point to be perfectly honest it was difficult for the company to make ends meet or to come anywhere near turning a profit or being able to grow the business charging the prices that we were, were charging so in terms of the scale of what we're doing um and the sort of the necessary revenue that we need our prices are set at a pretty reasonable spot i think when we compare them you know again if you compare them to other sort of ultra premium very very high demand whiskies let's say pappy van winkle for example nobody knows how many bottles of pappy van winkle they make they don't tell you that you know nobody knows how many bottles of yamazaki 18 year old they make they don't tell you that obviously supply is limited in comparison to demand but these are still products that are being produced by massive, massive commercial high volume distilleries. Right. Our prices for the most, you know, again, we're one one hundredth of the size of those businesses. So I think in terms of the amount of time and effort that we're putting into those particular products, hmm. that, you know, that kind of makes sense in terms of the price point. Oh, sure. Um, the other thing is though that we actually weren't the ones who raised our prices we were responding to what we saw in the retail market we were selling our products at a sort of standard wholesale rate into bottle shops around australia and as soon as we started winning awards we saw them put their prices up two three four five hundred percent wow and we weren't seeing a return on that because we were selling it to them for the same wholesale price as we always were so we actually turned around and said okay if this is the price you're selling it for we'll take a reasonable margin for you. You know, you'll get your 30% or whatever it should be. Sure. And, and, and that's what we're going to charge you from now on. So we sort of set our recommended retail prices on the basis of what we saw happening in the retail market. Um, and, and, 
certainly that upset some people, you know, that upset some of the people who had been drinking Star Wars at Cove for a long time and had been kind of loyal supporters of ours who then felt like they were getting a sort of rug pulled out from under them a little bit. Although, you know, our, uh, our least expensive whiskey, I suppose, is still relatively accessible as far as Australian craft single malt is concerned. So people generally will gravitate towards that particular product. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, I guess the, you know, to sum it all up, the short answer is, like I said, when we release products online, they're gone within an hour or two. So clearly we haven't found that, we haven't found that ceiling of price where people are going, nah, that's too much. They're Certainly still going, yeah, yeah, right, we'll take it, you know. I mean, the thing that strikes me, Fred, is because you are still a niche player and you're not trying to expand into whole new kind of non-whiskey drinking markets, you really are going after whiskey drinkers, but to offer them your brand, from what I understand, because you are at that yeah, small yeah. volume. And these are people that even if they were to go out and buy a very typical off the shelf whiskey, to spend a hundred bucks is quite typical. So to go from a typical bottle and maybe spend double or triple for something very special, in terms of a relative anchoring price point, I don't think it seems outrageous. So I, I, I think you're, it, it wouldn't surprise me if you're in a sweet spot on pricing, but uh, again, I don't claim to be an expert on alcohol, but uh, at least logically from other industries, what you're doing seems to be quite acceptable from a pricing position, I would think. Sure, well, absolutely. And again, we don't really expect people to start their, their whiskey journey or their single malt journey with Sullivan's Cove. It's a premium product. It's a single cask product, which means it's not, you know, it's going to vary from bottle to bottle and from release to release. Um, you know, as, as a lot of sort of good craft boutique products will do, you're getting a sort of unique story and a unique flavor profile every time you open one. Right. So it, you know, it's going to be for people who are a little bit more advanced in their whiskey journey. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we're, where we're aiming for, you know, again, you're not gonna, uh, well, for the most part, you're not going to drive a Bugatti as your first car, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a thing that people are going to come to a little bit, a little bit later. Um, and the really nice thing for us though, is that obviously there is, you know, a certain amount of our customers are, you know, relatively wealthy people, people who can afford to spend a couple hundred extra dollars on a bottle of whiskey, but we still have a huge customer base who are sort of, you know, everyday working Aussies who choose Sullivan's Cove as their special occasion whiskey. Sure. And I, and I love that because people respond to our story with their own stories. Yeah, and they'll, they'll call us up and they'll say, Oh, you know, I remember I, you know, I bought this bottle and I drank it with my wife on our wedding night. And now it's our five year anniversary. Can I get another one of those same bottles? Do you have any of that left? Wow. Would you be able to put one aside for me? Or, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, just had my first child that I want something really special that I can give to them on their 18th birthday or it's my father's 70th birthday and I want something really special for him. Um, and we love that stuff because that's great. It means that, you know, sort of our story is kind of becoming a part of somebody else's personal story and that that's really lovely as well. Uh, Fred, I love that. To me, I'm, I'm hearing all the ingredients of really powerful creative marketing executions. And, and uh, I mean, you guys just do it because it's, you love what you do, but I can see here that there's nothing better than if you take people along that continuum to the point where the, the description I use, Fred, just so you know, is that I talk about something called the love story and it starts with a one night stand and it goes all the way through five stages up until the point where you're committed partners, right? So uh, yeah. it sounds to me like when you get somebody up to that stage and they start contributing to the story, as you suggest, then at that point, it's very hard to pull that away. And, you know, it's hard for me to shape the creative person in me as well. When I hear you talking about people saying, this was our wedding drink, or now it's our five year anniversary. We've had it, we're celebrating a child, these milestone type things. I could see that you would be able to get some wonderful kind of customer generated assets to use in your marketing that people would resonate oh. with. I, I, I think it's an awesome idea. So congratulations on, on being smart about that. Um, <laughs> it, it, it kind of, it leads me to another question though. That surprised me about what you're doing with Sullivan's Cove, but you've been in the game for a bit now working on this brand. If you think that's mm. your time working with Sullivan's Cove, what has come as a surprise to you in the job that you're doing? Hmm, that's, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> obviously, like as as the as the sort of chief strategist for Sullivan's Cove, I try not to be surprised as often as possible. Um, but I guess uh, the things that have surprised me is that, or not necessarily surprised me, but that have been really really pleasant is. Um, 
you know, a couple of years ago, we created a new designation because some of our whiskies were getting very, very old by Australian standards in the cask. Um, so we started releasing 16, 17, 18, 19 year old whiskies, which considering that most Australian whiskey distilleries have been around for less than 10 years and considering that our climate is much, much warmer than Scotland. So 17 years here is not the equivalent of 17 years in Scotland. It's actually closer to Kentucky. So you would know that a 17 year old bourbon is very hard to come by. So um, a 17 year old Australian whiskey is basically unheard of. We're the only distillery in Australia that has whiskies of that age. And when I say we have them, I mean, there's like a handful of casks that are left over from the sort of early days when we were first whiskey. So we created a new price point for those whiskeys. And we said, look, we're going to price these along the same lines as something like a Yamazaki 18 year old, because it's just that rare. And it's really special to be able to offer Australian single malt um, of that age, because it's never happened before. And the whiskeys are outstanding um, and not like not like anything, a, a, a serious price point for those whiskies. Um, and I was sort of looking at it and going, okay, I think these are going to probably sell a little bit more slowly than our traditional things just because, yeah. you know, yeah, it's, it's a significant jump in price. Um, and people snap them up just as quickly. Wow. I mean, that to me, if, if that latent demand out there to take a, a, a sort of a premium, premium product off your hands. It just speaks to the equity of the brand that you've got and the fact that you, you know, it's, it's such a nice, uh, let me put it this way, it's such a nice problem to be in that you've created something that's so powerful and resonates with a customer base that you can, actually can't keep up with everything they want. I think what a, every marketer in the world would like to be in your shoes, aside from the fact that you get to try some nice whiskey. So yeah, so you've told me a little bit about the fact that, you know, historically you're in the lead time for distilling whiskey. You've started to sort of ramp up accordingly as you saw demand as a company, you saw the demand start to increase. But is there anything else on the future for Sullivan's Co that you're excited about or where you see the brand going in future? Sorry, you broke up for a second there. Can you repeat the question for me? Yeah, sorry, Fred, this internet connection is not great. I'm actually on uh, a little bit of a vacation at the moment, so I'm not on my, my normal internet connection. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> I, the question was, you know, I know that back when you started winning awards and you, you started to invest in ramping up uh, production, that sort of mm. set you on a path for a certain sort of future. But I'm yep. interested in any other ways, are you excited or looking forward to anything particularly in the future for the brand with Sullivan's Cove? Is there anything around the corner that you're looking forward to? Uh, well, there's, you know, I mean, again, it's fun because our, our lead times when it comes to experiments are so long. We've, we're now kind of bottling some of the experiments that our distillers were doing 10 years ago. It's really fun for you to sort of go through the stacks of barrels and go, oh, that's a bit funny. What was happening then, you know? And these guys trying to remember what was going on in their minds 10 years ago and what was happening in the market. Yeah. 10 years ago. That we found was um, an Australian Chardonnay cask, a 300 litre French oak Australian Chardonnay cask that was filled with whiskey 10 years ago. Um, and when I tasted it, uh, sort of out of the cask, I thought this, this is absolutely outstanding. Um, wow. And so we've now been laying down a few more Chardonnay casks over the last couple of years to try to scale up that particular line. Wow. So that, you know, eight or nine years from now, we'll have a sort of line extension for Sullivan's Cove that will be 100% aged in um, Australian white wine casks, which is super cool. Um, yeah. But we've got a beautiful wine industry here in Australia, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and that is one of the things that really sort of sets us apart from Scotch single malt whiskies or Japanese single malt whiskies is that we have access to these outstanding wine casks. So we're already employing quite a lot of fortif Australian fortified wine casks. Mm -hmm. Fortified wine we make here. There are a lot of distillers around Australia now who are focusing on red wine casks because we're obviously known for our um, Shiraz in Australia in particular. So Starwood, a really good example of making beautiful sort of red wine cask aged single malt Australian whiskey. Um, our spirit in particular doesn't really like playing with red wine as much. Uh, it works out better in white wine casks. So that's a, that's a style that we're focusing on, which I think is going to be a super cool thing to see in the future. Wow, that is interesting. So 
as you plow on, you'll, you'll be able to kind of further differentiate yourself in this kind of novel way. It just, to me, it just adds to the story. Fred, this is, this is really awesome. I've loved learning about this myself. If you could sort of change hatch for a minute now, for, for a moment, just sort of step out of, of your role as being the Sullivan's Cove strategist. If you were a mentor to somebody who is in a business for themselves, uh, mm. and they were trying to perhaps build a brand, especially let's say in a niche or a premium space, is there a piece of advice or a rule of thumb that you would always want somebody like that to remember and hold on to to help them out as they grow their own business? Any sort of general principles? Uh, look, I mean, I guess it's, you know, I have a particularly personal approach to it, I guess, which, you know, is informed by my bartending career, amongst other things, I think, and, and also my kind of um, position sort of in between Gen X and, and, and millennial, that sort of elder millennial, you know, thing where I think that we're, we're really wary of marketing, you know, people are pretty switched on. And I think that, um, you know, people can smell a rat pretty easily these days. So my approach to it is always just to be honest and direct. You know what I mean? Even though we are a, a sort of an ultra premium product, our advertising is not, you know, somebody in a flowy dress playing a violin on a mountaintop. We don't go for that sort of like super esoteric, you know, a lot of the stuff, if you look at our website, I, I, products and talking about the production process, because they're the people who make it. You know, sometimes I'm on the videos just to explain certain little parts of the story that I know a little bit better than those guys. But for the most part, nobody wants to see me talking about it, right? I'm just the marketing guy. They want to see the people who actually make the stuff. And I don't edit them. I don't give them scripts. I just they sit in front of the camera and talk about how we make the whiskey. And that's going to be really interesting to people. Um, I think, you know, it is, it is an artisanal product and people want to hear from those guys. So I guess, yeah, that'd be my advice is find out what's cool about your product have something that is cool and different and special about it. And then just tell that story to people straight up. Um, and, and I think people respond to that. I love that. So, so if I, if I was, I, I'm not trying to change your words or put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing from you anyway, is about a sort of a simplicity and an authenticity around what it is that you're offering that's special. And I really like that. So I, I totally agree. I think that, I think it's probably true across all generations, but as you say, especially the current generation where people, which is the other way we might think of the word customers, people mm. have a, a highly attuned bullshit detector. And if, yeah, if, brands, absolutely. if brands these days try and come up with something that just does not connect with what they authentically are, then it'll be dismissed. And even worse than that, it won't even be considered by people. It'll be like one of these da- you know, pieces of data that come into our senses and then flow right out without taking any notice. But I, yeah, uh, in the model that I try and, and take businesses through, which is built on some behavioral economics and some other kind of empirical sciences. I always try and say that a business needs to identify something that's about originality. And usually that's about some surprise and something that sort of ha- helps a brand stand out. And all that does really is make somebody stop and take notice and just think slowly for half a second. And so that yeah, those yeah. data points don't wash past, right? So when, when I see an Australian whiskey wins the whiskey uh, of the whole, you know, is, the, is awarded the best whiskey in the whole world, I can't help but stop and, and pay a little bit of attention. And then the second part in, in uh, this is called the core yeah, marketing yeah. method, which is an acronym. The second part is the C, which is credibility. And to your point, the only way that a brand can, can maintain any credibility is if it shows from the outset and all the way along that it's absolutely authentic. And sort of, I think down to earth and relatability is a big part of this authenticness that can, can happen in a business. So I'm, I'm right with you. I love what you have to suggest. And I love the story of what you guys have been able to build down there in Sullivan's Cove. Hey, uh, Fred, this has been great chatting with you. I, I, really, I really love uh, what you guys are doing. Most of the folk who are watching this are probably going to be in North America or maybe in Europe. I've got, there's some Aussies and Kiwis as well. But for people who are in, people in the US or maybe Europe, uh, obviously there's your website, which I'll link to. But is there any other way that people might be able to actually try Sullivan's Cove? I'm, I'm thinking particularly in the US. Where, where would someone go to, to try Sullivan's Cove for themselves? Yeah, so the US is, is quite difficult. Um... As, as I'm not um, anyone who will regulatory frameworks in the US are very, very complicated and difficult. So we do have trouble getting product over there, but we've got two key retailers that we work with in the US. Um, on the East Coast, we've got Asta Wines in Manhattan. 
um, and they ship to about 38 different states. So that, that's kind of our, our primary way of getting bottles to people in the US. If they want to try one, they can do that. And in California, we work with k and um, they've, got, they've got three different locations and they can basically ship to anywhere in California. In, uh, we do have some distribution in UK and also in Western Europe. Um, and people's best bets there is to just sort of go into their, um, you know, just find the, the best whiskey bar you can and, and ask about us. Awesome. You know what I might do, Fred, if you and I connect after this on email, if there's some links to those points, I'll just, I'll just throw them down. People can figure out if they want to. Uh, Fred, I really appreciate you taking some time, mate, to speak with us. It's great to hear another Aussie accent, and especially to hear about this amazing product that you guys are kind of putting out there. So congratulations on what you've achieved so far. And uh, thanks for spending some time having a talk with me today. Thanks so much, mate. Really appreciate the chat. Good on you, Fred. Speak again. Bye-bye. Yes, yes.